Steve is ministering at Liberty Covenant this morning, so we're we're Steveless, but uh, we'll we'll carry on. Let me give you a few announcements. We're going to be having prayer meeting tonight at six o'clock. Love to have you come and pray with us. Tuesday evening at six, we'll be ministering, Lord willing, at Yancey House. We'd like to have anybody that would like to go meet us up there about six. Wednesday evening at seven is Bible study this week. And those are the announcements that I have. Does anybody else have one? Okay. Let me tell you about a couple of ministry opportunities. We're going to be starting up a nursery service for our morning worship service. So if you would like to participate in that on a rotating basis, uh, coordinate with Teresa Cox. Um, another ministry opportunity is some folks have expressed interest in maybe giving half a day a month as a ministry to the church to help clean. So if you would be willing to do that on a rotating basis, check with uh, Steve and Lenny. So there's a couple of ministry opportunities for you. Uh, <clears throat> before we start this morning, we want to pray. Uh, we've got some prayer requests that we've been asked to remember. Jesse has asked us to be praying for him. Um, Sam was talking about Mayberry, Mayberry, a friend of his that's sick. Uh, Bruce McKinney just had a hip, uh, re, hip, not hip replacement. It was a hip replacement. Okay, please pray for him. Of course, you know Gene had shoulder surgery, so love on him, but don't hug him or punch him. <laughs> Sam. <laughs> and uh, please remember uh, Rachel uh, McKinney, please be praying for her. And also remember uh, the Africa mission that's ongoing. Uh, they've They've traveled from Uganda into Kenya, so please be keeping them in your prayers. So let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for another opportunity to come into your house and worship. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. And Lord, thank you that you still answer. You're still on the throne. You're still almighty God. And Lord, you're still merciful, and your grace is sufficient. So Lord, today as we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise and come before your presence with singing as Psalm 100 instructs us. Lord, anoint us that we can worship in spirit and in truth. And Father, we pray that every person that comes this way today would find what they need in your presence because, Lord, in your presence is fullness of joy. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. In Psalms, it talks about how it is our honor to praise the Lord because of what praise does to the enemy. And we all know we've got an enemy, right? If you've mm -hmm. not encountered him, mm, there's something going on because <laughs> he is all tore up, but praise binds him up with fetters of iron and it says and that's our honor to be able to praise and bind him up it's the honor that all the saints have. And you think, well, I'm not a saint. Well, a saint, somebody who's walking with Jesus, we're saints. So stand up and let's bind the enemy with fetters of iron. It is our honor. Glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah. 
of praise glory hallelujah every breath is praise this week let every breath you breathe be praise let it be something to bring glory and honor to our father and let it be not negative and not pessimism and not bring people down let it be something to edify and to lift him up because he said if i be lifted up i'll draw people to me and that's what we have got to have in this revival time. We need people to be drawn to him. So every praise, every breath is praise, and every praise is to our God. Sing loud, sing loud. Oh, every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. I see people singing I've never seen sing. This is awesome. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Oh, glory, hallelujah to our God. Every praise, 
Every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to our God. Oh, glory, hallelujah to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Lift it up. Come on. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Focus on Him. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. God, my Savior, God, my healer, and God, my deliverer, yes, He is, yes, He is, God, my Savior, confess it, He's your healer, God, my healer, and God, my is every praise is to our god every word of worship in one accord every praise every praise is to our god he's worthy of our praise every praise is to our god and every word of worship in one accord Every praise, every praise is to our God. Let's declare it this morning. God, my Savior, God, my healer, God, my deliverer. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. God, my Savior. God, my healer, God, my deliverer, yes, he is, yes, he is. Every praise is to our God, every word of worship in one accord, every praise, every praise. Is to our God. Every leader to our God. Glory to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. And every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. Amen and amen and amen. Blessed be the Lord Most High. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. You know, we were at the jail the other night singing, and they're pretty, they're trying to be cool, they're trying to be hard, they're trying to stare you down, and God love them. When we started singing about the blood of Jesus, I saw little people that I know, have heard that song and they were sort of hiding and singing with us and then some tears started and one one of the guys started just weeping and he had to take his little orange jumpsuit and just wipe his face and I thought Lord what power there is in just the name of Jesus or in just the blood or in just the gospel all David did in his pitiful little voice was <laughs> was give his testimony and those guys I could see in their eyes that they knew David 
was just a person and that he cared about them. And there's so much power in that because God is the God who sees us. And I know those guys sometimes think, here we are. Nobody cares. Nobody sees us. We messed up. It's all over. David said, you know, society makes you pay for what you do wrong. But God forgives. And he can wash you white as snow. And we know there's only one thing that can wash us white as snow. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus amen for my pardon this i see And for my cleansing, this my plea, but the, blood the blood of Jesus. Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. This verse is very important. It's not by works. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood, the blood of Jesus. Is the flow that makes me white as snow? No other found I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace nothing but the blood of Jesus this is all my righteousness nothing but the blood, the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow the White as snow, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus amen, amen. power the blood of Jesus cleanses us, covers all our sin. Devil can't stand to hear about the blood. When 
when I am overwhelmed, I just start talking about the blood. I just say, you know what my Lord did for me? And do you know what covers me? And you cannot get through the blood to get to me? And I just tell him, we resist you in the name of Jesus. We submit to our God. We are covered in his blood. And when that blood flowed down the cross and went down in the ground and went on the mercy seat, it was finished. It was done. And we can, all we have to do is accept it and receive it. It seems too easy, doesn't it? We make it so hard. But he made it so easy. His name, above every other name, there is no other name whereby we can be saved. There's not a lot of roads. There's one door, only one. I used to sing when I was a little girl. One door and only one. And yet it's sides are two. I'm on the inside. Oh, which side are you? I remember that. And I remember when I went on the inside. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Written glory in creation, now revealed in you, O Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, our King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. without us. Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. My King, 
What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. Silence the voice of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring. Praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names what a powerful name it is what a powerful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a powerful name it is and nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Lord, we're so thankful for that name today. There is no name like the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. Lord, I thank you that hell trembles at the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that heaven listens when they hear the name of Jesus. So, Lord, today we come in that marvelous name. We come to worship, we come to praise, we come to seek your face, and we come to desire your presence. So, Lord, today we worship and praise and give thanks for the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we ask you to give us ears to hear, and, Lord, speak what you want spoken today, and only what you want. We submit to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> I apologize, but the voice still isn't completely back, but it's getting there. So the, we'll, 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 we'll see this through. We're going to begin today in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, and he tells them what he's praying for them. And this is familiar scripture to most of us. But this is what he said. He said, For this cause I bow my knees unto Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Way back in the dark ages of the 60s, before there were cell phones, before there were home computers, before there was an internet, before there was Facebook, before there was any civilization at all, there was a group of insects, I mean beetles, from Liverpool that had a song called Love, All You Need Is Love. I'm always amazed at how close secular musicians can be to the truth. You know, they get an inspiration and they write a song and perform it. 
And there's always a nugget or a kernel of truth in those songs. And they're so close to being exactly right. And the truth is, all you need is love, but it's got to be a particular kind. It's got to be God's love. If I ask you this morning why Jesus came to this earth, most people would say to seek and to save that which was lost. Or to save people's lives, not to destroy them. But that's what he did. The reason that he came to this earth is what he told Nicodemus when that religious leader came to him by night and said, we know that nobody could do what you're doing except they were sent from God. And Jesus began to talk to him, and he said this, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. You see, the reason Jesus came is because of the love of God. I've heard this said, the most beautiful three words that you'll ever hear spoken are, I love you. Doesn't matter if it's that girl that you've been chasing, fellas, or if it's your parents, or if it's husband or wife, or if it's a friend, the most awesome words you can hear is, I love you. And this world is starved for love the new testament you know the bible is divided in those two parts the old testament the new testament the new testament is god saying i love you the old testament tells you the reason that he that that he has to love you and the reason that you've got to respond to that love it tells you about what happened in the beginning and how everything came to be the way it is today and the fact that you desperately need God's love in your life and the New Testament tells you how God sent his love through his son Jesus you see there's two opposing forces in this world today there's a force of love and there's a force of hate the Bible says that God is love so you see real love in this world is God moving God's kingdom and then there's the, the force of hate. And we know that Satan is the one who's the proprietor of that kingdom. In the Bible, Jesus tells us about that whole deal. John 10 and 10. Jesus said, The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life they might have it more abundantly. If, if you've been watching what's going on around us today, you know there's a great move of God taking place across this country. We've talked about how it began in Wilmore, Kentucky at Asbury, and then it began to spread. It's in many states right now, mainly in colleges and universities, some middle schools and, and places of education. And it's spreading. And you know, you may stop and say, well, why, why now? Why is this the moment that all this renewal or this awakening or this revival is taking place? Well, folks, let me tell you something. A revival or an awakening is God pouring out his love. It's, like Je it's just like Jesus said, he came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to save people's lives, not to destroy them. And when revival takes place, when an awakening begins to happen, God's love begins to be poured down and, and his love causes people to repent and his love causes people to want to be saved and on and on and on. So God's love is being poured out right now across this country. And the reason that God chose now, I fully believe, is because of the degree of hate that was being spread across this country. You stop and think about what, what's going on and, and what's being pushed and the flames are being fanned and you've got racial hatred. You've got the woke hatred. You've got political hatred. You've got sexual identity hatred. And it just goes on and on. It seems like everything possible to stir hatred in this nation is being unleashed and being promoted. And I was thinking about everything that's trying to divide us. And I was thinking about how God's move is pouring out his love. Proverbs 10 and verse 12 says this, 
Hatred stirreth up strife, but love covers all sins. And that's the thing, you know, Joy led us in that song about nothing but the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus cleanses our sins. And God wants us to know that he loves us enough that he was willing to cause the blood of his son to be shed, to cover our sins, and not just to cover them, but to wash them away, to separate them from us, and to remove the record that it will not be brought up again. The Word of God says when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and surrender our life to him, our sins and iniquities he'll remember no more. God's love being poured out. When we experience that love that God has for us, it causes us to love one another. And folks, that's one of the keys to let you know that if you are truly a child of God. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14 says this, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. If we, if we don't have love in our hearts for the people around us, then we need to stop and say, well, have I got God's love in me? Because if I'm not loving, then there's a problem in here somewhere. Because God is love, and if he's residing in me, then there should be love in me and love coming out from me instead of bitterness and hatred and on and on so many other things. I was thinking about the fact that, you know, when, when somebody meets Jesus, love begins to be stirred up within them. I was thinking about the disciples. The Bible tells us that when Andrew met Jesus, the first thing he did was run and find his brother Simon and say, we have found the Messiah. We found the one that loves us. When Philip met Jesus, he ran to find Nathaniel. And he said, we found the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. When you come to know the love of Jesus Christ, you've got to go tell somebody else. You see, the reason I came to Jesus is because the love of God that was showed to me through a co-worker. And when I experienced that love, I had to go tell people. I had to go to my friends and say, listen, I have found something that is so incredible and so awesome. I want you to know about it. I want you to experience it. And man, I tell you, I started dragging people to church. Sometimes they came kicking and screaming, but I intended for them to be here. And you know, we need to be that way now. And if we're not, then we need a renewal of the love of God in us because there's nothing like his love, nothing in the world like his love. And I'm absolutely convinced that the greatest need the church has today is to experience the depth of the love of God. When John was on the Isle of Patmos, and you read this, of course, in the book of Revelation, after Jesus appeared to him, and, and John was just floored by the glorious uh, appearance of Jesus Christ today. You know, we often picture him as the babe in the manger. We often picture him as the carpenter from Nazareth. We picture him as the, the, the itinerant preacher that was going around the Sea of Galilee and meeting with fishermen and different people like that. We often picture him as the one hanging on the cross. But folks, let me tell you today, he's not the suffering Messiah. He's the glorious Lord of all. And when John saw him, he said, I fell at his feet as dead. And he had to place his hand on me and said, don't be afraid. But after that encounter, Jesus began to talk to him and he said, I want you to write what you're about to see. And I want you to write seven letters to seven churches in Asia. And the first letter was to the church at Ephesus. And he began to talk about their works and the things that they were doing. But he said, you've left your first love, and I have somewhat against you because of that. The final letter was to the church at Laodicea, and he reprimanded them for being lukewarm and thinking that they didn't need anything, and he ended this way in Revelation 3 and verse 20. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He wasn't even in the church. He was outside. 
if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. If you look that word sup up, or it's, it's translated, uh, if you look it up in the Greek, this is what it means. According to Thayer's Greek lexicon, it means to share an intimate and joyful relationship. Jesus said, I'll come in and I'll bring my love with me. And we're, we're, we'll rejoice together. God wants his love to be restored to his people. And he wants his people to return to the love that they knew when they first encountered Jesus Christ. We can be believers and still not know the depth of God's love. Even if we've experienced it because, you know, we can allow situations brought on by the enemy to move us away from God's love. So let's go back over here to Ephesians chapter 3 again for a minute and look what Paul was praying. In verse 17, he said, I'm praying that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love. You see, love has got to be the foundation for everything that we do as a child of God. Love has to be the nutrient, the fertilizer that causes fruit to come forth. We have to be rooted and grounded in love. It has to be the basis of everything that we do. Verse 18, that you might be able to comprehend with all the saints what's the breadth, length, and depth, and height of God's love. And that word comprehend is an interesting word because it doesn't just mean to understand something, but it means to take hold of it and make it your own. God wants us to take hold of his love, and he wants that love to become a part of us, and he wants that love to flow out from us to the people around us. That's why I'm saying the church needs to experience the depth and breadth and length and height of the love of God. And verse 19 says, And to know that love of Christ, which passes knowledge, it's beyond comprehension, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God experiencing and knowing the love of God is what fills us with all of God's fullness. I think we often, often forget what God's love is really like. We think about him loving us, to, loving us enough to send Jesus. We think about him loving enough to forgive our sins. We think about him loving enough to not send us to hell. Loving us enough to listen to our prayers. But we really, I don't think, grasp the depth of God's love. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And you know, this is a, this is a scripture that we use a lot of times at weddings. <laughs> talking about what love is. But the love that's being described as Paul's writing this to the Corinthian church or the church at Corinth is God's love. And this is the kind of love that God has for us. Let's, let's look at this. 1 Corinthians 13, I'm going to begin in verse 4. It's translated in the King James's charity, but it means love. That's what the word is if you look it up in Greek. It says love suffers long. It means it puts up with a whole lot. And man, if God didn't have love that was long-suffering, we wouldn't be here today. Can you imagine what he's put up with and he's not destroyed us because God loves us. That's amazing to me. Love suffers long and it's kind. If God wasn't kind, we wouldn't be here today. Love envies not. Folks, God doesn't get jealous of anything you've got. God doesn't envy anything that you accomplish. And we're not supposed to be jealous of what something that somebody else has. We're not supposed to be jealous of what something somebody accomplishes. You know, a lot of times I see people get envious because maybe somebody can do something better than they can. You know, the Bible says that God gives us gifts based on what God knows and what he wants accomplished and he knows who he can trust with money he knows who he can trust with talent he knows who he can trust with assignments and that's the way he deals things out 
according to that measure that God uses to measure. So we shouldn't be jealous of what some somebody else has or what somebody is able to do because God doesn't. It says love doesn't vaunt itself. In other words, it doesn't lift itself up. It doesn't say, look at me, man, I am something else. The Bible says in another place we ought to think of ourselves more highly than we should. We need to take ourselves with a grain of salt and be able to laugh at ourselves. If we can't do that, we're in trouble. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that when God made some of us, he had to laugh a little bit, especially Jeff Burns. <clears throat> I love you, brother. <clears throat> it's not puffed up. You know, uh, a lot of times, if things don't go our way, we get kind of puffed up, don't we? I got tickled at one of my grand, my least granddaughter the other day. We were trying to get her to take some medicine, and she rolled that lower lip out, you know. And <laughs> I got down on her face and started rolling mine out, too, and she cracked up. But we shouldn't get puffed up over stuff. We shouldn't get puffed up if we think we've accomplished something, and we shouldn't get puffed up if we think somebody's not doing what they ought to because God doesn't. Love doesn't behave itself unseemingly. Doesn't pitch a fit. Love doesn't seek its own, and it's not easily provoked. A lot of us are on a hair trigger, aren't we? Wear our feelings on our sleeves, man. If somebody bumps us the wrong way, whew, mercy. You know, we should be tender-hearted and thick-skinned. Because that's the way God is. Think about how much he's put up with us. My, my, my. It thinks no evil. So many times you hear the expression, I don't get mad, I get even. Folks, I want to tell you, that's not God. That's not God. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Sometimes when we hear a bit of gossip, it seems like we rejoice more than we, when we hear that than we do when we hear that somebody's done something really good. Because we love to grab onto a piece of gossip and go and say, I got something I want you to pray about, but did you hear what so-and-so did? We need to be careful. God doesn't do that. He doesn't rejoice when somebody stumbles and falls. He rejoices in the truth when somebody speaks the truth and tells the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. It means you've got someone else's best interest at heart. Now, that's the love of God we're talking about today. And that's the love that you and I need to have. That's the love the church needs to have. And that's only coming from the love of God. And that's why I'm saying the church's greatest need today is an outpouring of God's love on us. Because when His love is in us, His love will come through us and show to people around us. And you know, in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, the Spirit of God reminds us that without that love in us, nothing we do will accomplish anything. Let me read the first three verses to you. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I'm become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mystery and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. Unless everything we do comes from love, it's worthless. I've heard people say that a revival is when people repent. 
And people do repent in a revival. They repent during a move of God. But folks, let me tell you something. What causes them to repent? And what causes them to repent is God's love. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 says this. Despise thou the riches and goodness and forbearance and long suffering, talking about of God, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance. God's love is what causes you to repent. I mean, for a lot of my life, people would threaten me with the judgment of God. A lot of my life, people would say, don't you know that what you're doing is wrong? Don't you know you're going straight to hell and on and on? That didn't get me to Jesus. But when I encountered the love of God, when I felt God's love, all I could do is repent because His goodness and His mercy and all those things grabbed my heart and made me repent. And that's why there's so much repentance in revival because revival is when God's love comes down and grabs hold of you and you experience it. Think about it. The goodness, the love of God. You know, Jesus told his disciples something in John 13, verses 34 and 35. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you. That you also love one another by this, shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. What was the commandment of Jesus Christ? That we love one another as he loved us. How did he love us? Well, first of all, he loved us before we loved him. He didn't wait for us to love him to love us. He loved us before. He loved us while we were yet sinners, living in rebellion against him and, his, and the things of God. He loved us when we wanted nothing to do with him. So think about that. He said, I want you to love one another the way I love you. Before, I need to love you before you love me. I need to love you while you're not doing the things that I think you ought to be doing. I need to love you when you want nothing to do with me. That's how we're supposed to love one another. Think about that. That's not easy, is it? And the only way you can do it is to have God's love in you. And the only way you're going to have that is when you're wrapped up in it. That's what revival is all about. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. <laughs> Why? Because love brings repentance. God's love is what causes us to repent and God's love through us can cause someone else to repent. If we hate somebody, if we hold a grudge, if we refuse to forgive, what we do is fuel the devil's fire. But if we're obedient to God, repentance and healing comes forth. That's why Jesus said, this is the commandment. Love one another like I love you. Because if we do that, it will cause hatred to be diffused. If we do that, it will cause people to repent. If we do that, it will cause healing to take place. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and don't do the things I say? You know, well, you don't know what so-and-so did. You don't know what so-and-so said. It doesn't matter. Jesus said, this is my commandment. Love one another like I love you. Love one another before that other person loves you, even while they're rebelling against you, and even when they don't want anything to do with you. You love them. Because that love, that goodness, is what brings repentance. God's love causes sinners to repent. It causes the lost to be saved. It brings healings to, healing to hearts and to relationships and hurts. And it even brings healing to our physical body. 
I was talking to my son who is on the mission in Africa. And while they were still in Uganda before they were started going over to Kenya, he was telling me about a, a young girl that was deaf. And he said in one of the services, God's love came down and suddenly she heard. He said, you should have seen her face. Here's someone that's in the service. She's not hearing anything. And all of a sudden, she's hearing. That's God's love. No other reason. Not because of something the girl did. Not because of something that somebody else did. It was just simply the love of God being bestowed on that girl. And God's love still heals. God's love still works. And folks, let me tell you, it's still available in this country. It's not just in Africa. It's not just in Cuba. It's not just in China or India or other places where great moves of God are taking place and have continued to take place. Not just in South Korea. It's happening across this country right now. Relationships are being healed. People are being saved. Lives are being transformed as God's love comes down in revival. In revival. The enemy wants you to believe that God hates you. That he doesn't love you and he only wants to punish you. But folks, let me tell you. Whatever the devil says can't change the word of God. And God's word says, God is love. God's love. If you happen to be here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I want you to know that God loves you. Right now. Right where you are, doesn't matter what condition you're in, God loves you. If you're here today, and maybe you've known God, but you drifted away from Him, I want you to know God loves you. If you're here today and you've been hurt by somebody that's chilled your relationship with God, know this, God loves you. If you're here today and you're tired and you're struggling, God loves you. And if you're here today and you're facing a trial that's caused you to be afraid, God loves you. God's love brings repentance. It brings salvation. It brings reconciliation. It brings healing. It brings comfort. And it brings strength. Is there anybody here today that needs to feel God's love? Is there anybody here that wants to know the breadth and length and depth and height of his love? I do. I do. I want that fresh love of God to be filled in every part of my being. I want to know the love of God to surround me and fill me to the point that it's going to come out to the people around me. I don't want my attitude to come out. I don't want my opinions to come out. I want the love of God to come out. I want to be obedient to what Jesus said. This is the commandment that I'm giving you. Love one another as I have loved you. And that's what revival's about. I've watched these young people in these services and, and, and people that have been ill at one another are coming together and weeping and forgiving one another and being filled with the glory and the presence of God. People that didn't know Jesus, somebody just goes up to them and begins to show them love of God and people are getting saved. All kinds of things are happening. And folks, God wants to pour that love out on us, not just in the colleges and universities, not just in the school systems, but he wants to pour it out on his people in the church because we Need it too. We need the love of God to fill us and surround us and envelop us and come out from us to one another and to a lost world. Yes, all you need is love. God's love. The Bible says he that love fulfills the law. That's what we need today. And this morning as we conclude, I'm going to ask God 
to pour his love on us. I'm going to ask him to just do a special outpouring of that love in this place. You see, he tells us, just like he told the church at Laodicea, he said, I'm knocking. And if you can hear, if you can hear me, and if you'll open up, I'll come in and we'll have that joyous communion. We'll have that joyous fellowship. You'll experience my love. I'm going to ask you this morning, if you would stand. And we're going to worship for just a minute. And as Teresa plays this music, if, if you need to be wrapped up in his love today, if you need that love touch on you today, whether it be for salvation, whether it be to just get closer to God, whether it be for healing, whatever it is, I want to just invite you to just come down to the altar this morning. And, and, and as, as we worship God, just ask him for that love to come and, and touch you and bring healing and, and anything you need. Father, today, I want to thank you for, for the fact that you are love. I want to thank you for the fact that you showed us how much you loved us by sending Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you've given us your book that tells us how much you love us, that you love us so much. And today you still love us, and that love is still available to any person that will come and receive it. It's available to every person that will say, God, I need your love. I need you to show me your love. I want to experience your love. I want to know the length and breadth and depth and height of the love of God. So today, Lord, I'm asking you, would you pour that love on me? Would you fill me with your love? Would you heal me with your love? Just like you did that young girl over in Uganda. Lord, would you touch me with your love so that I can be obedient to what Jesus said and love others the way you love me that will bring healing to the places in my heart that hurt that will cause me to be able to forgive when somebody doesn't forgive me Lord would you do that today Lord I ask it in Jesus name Teresa go ahead and play that if you would Folks, if you need some of God's love, an extra portion, just, just come gather in the altar today. And I'm going to trust him to meet us here. Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Lord, we need your love. We need the love of God poured out on us. We need your love poured out on us, Lord. You've poured it out in so many places. You've poured it out in Asbury. You've poured it out in Lee University. Lord, you've poured it out in Texas A&M. You've poured it out in middle schools in Tennessee. God, we need your love. Lord, let the love of God just envelop us this morning. Let the love of God begin to heal hearts and hurts. Let the love of God begin to draw people back to you that have drifted away. Let the love of God begin to bring people to you that have never surrendered their life to you. Let the love of God begin to heal relationships. Let the love of God begin to heal physical bodies. Lord, rain down. Rain down on us today. Holy oh, worship. God, we need the love of God. We need you, Jesus. Oh, just touch every person. Touch every person, Lord, that comes and says, Lord, I want your love to surround me. I want your love to fill me. Lord, I need it today. Lord, fill each one of us. Lord, let the love of God heal everything that needs healing. Fill everything that needs filling. Bring healing and restoration. God, just anoint us with your love this morning. Let the love of God be the power that moves us today. Lord, fill with your love. Fill with your spirit. Fill with your presence. God, wrap us up. Wrap us up in your love. Wrap us up. 
Father, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for your precious love. Anoint us today. Anoint us today with the love of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just let him come. Let him hold you. Let him let, let his warmth just surround you today. Lord, touched by your love this morning. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, we need you. We need God's love in us so that the world around us can see and experience the love of God. Lord, I'm so thankful for the person that contained your love and shared that love with me back so many years ago that completely transformed my life. And God, I pray that that love would transform lives in this place today. Lord, it doesn't matter if we're old or young. It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what we have or what we don't have. Lord, you love us. It doesn't matter where we stand. You still love us. And you loved us so much that you came to this earth and you paid the price for our sin. Lord, I'm so thankful today. I'm so thankful. Lord, change our hearts. Change our lives. And Lord, let the love of God surround us and fill us. Lord, I pray Lord, I pray that we'll hear testimonies of people being touched by your love today. That things will be transformed. Our feelings, our attitudes, our emotions, our reactions, our relationships, even our physical bodies. We need your love, Jesus. We need your love. So we surrender to you. We surrender to you today. Our hope is in you. And your word says, if we'll ask, we'll receive. So, Lord, let it rain down today. Let it rain down. Let it rain down. Father, I ask your blessing on every person in this building today. I ask your blessing, Lord, on every family. I ask your blessing on their homes, their extended families. Lord, everything that needs a touch, I ask you to touch it today. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that's never accepted Jesus, let this be the moment that they come to know the love of God and that love causes them to repent and surrender their life to you. And Lord, I pray that right now you would fill us to overflowing, that when we leave this place, we're going to have more of God's love in us than we've ever had. And Lord, that love is what people will sense and that love will transform lives around us. So we're looking for your love, Lord. Let us begin to comprehend the length and breadth and depth and height and to know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge so that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. We love you because you first loved us. Thank you, Father, for this time and your presence. Thank you for each one of these that have come to be a part of this service today. And Lord, use us for your glory in these last days. And let your love flow through us to a world that desperately needs the love of God. We ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless each one of you. Remember, we're going to have prayer meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.